welcome to this presentation of the Rotary Club of North Bethesda, Maryland, USA. Our club was established in 1974. We meet every Friday morning at 7.45 a.m. and we often invite guest speakers to give presentations on all kinds of interesting subjects. Please contact us through our website at nbrotary.org. And thanks for watching. Our speaker today is Katie Frohart, Executive Director of the nonprofit organization Wild Earth Allies. She will be introduced by Linda Bergcross. Today we have a wonderful speaker. Uh, her name is Katie Frohart. Katie, am I pronouncing it, your last name correctly? That is absolutely perfect, and here okay. I am. Oh, there you are. Hi, Katie. All right, let me give uh, the formal introduction. With over 25 years experience, Katie is a recognized nonprofit leader, field practitioner, and international conservationist. At the helm of Wild Earth Allies since 2003, and leading our rebranding in uh, her rebranding in 2016, Katie focuses on delivering the Wild Earth Allies mission to protect vital areas of our natural world for the benefit of wildlife, habitats, and people by inspiring collaborative action. Her grounded leadership style draws from years spent living in Rwanda as director of the International Guerrilla Conservation Program and as program technical director for the African Wildlife Foundation. Her earlier career included grant making with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation private sector natural resource management consulting and land use planning. Katie serves as an environmental liaison with Rachel's Network, a notable community of women philanthropists and was recently selected as an inaugural member of Charity Navigators Consultative Council of Nonprofit Leaders. She holds a master's degree from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, where she combined study of landscape ecology with coursework at the Yale School of Management on applied economics and nonprofit management. She completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Virginia with a major in environmental studies. And we are so pleased to have you here this morning to share with us and enlighten us. And hopefully you can share screen easily. I can indeed. So I will turn to that. But first, a quick thank you to you, Linda, for the invitation. It's an honor to be with you and to join you all. I've long been a, an admirer of the Rotary, so I've seen your work in all corners of the world. And um, so thank you. This sort of global outlook, but local engagement, um, I think it's something we could all do a lot more of these days. So many thanks for having me. And I am going to share my screen now. All right, so is that beginning to come up for you all? Yes. Yes, yes. All right. Well, again, Linda, thank you for a lovely introduction, and I'm going to dive right in. Um, we have got a lot to cover together this morning, so please slow me down if I begin to talk too quickly, and um, I am happy to take questions along the way or for you to hold them at the end, whatever your preference is. But we are going to, today, I wanted to give you a feel for our global operation. Linda has given you a snapshot through my bio. But I wanted to, again, do a bit of an around the world tour with you this morning. I'm going to focus for a little more time on our work with great apes and hopefully whet your appetite for the rest of our portfolio. So this is where we start, right? So our focus really is on healthy natural systems that can support all life. And we do this driving towards a mission that permits our strategic focus on specific areas where we feel we've got the greatest opportunity for impact that will benefit people, wildlife, and habitats. Linda, you mentioned in the bio this notion of collaborative action, and that is something that will come up repeatedly in re my remarks. Um, again, we work with a wide range of stakeholders to get this work done, and, um, and that is part of the way we are structured. This gives you a bit of a road, further roadmap, and again, to locate you on the places we will touch on today. And um, I just wanna draw your attention to the, the bottom part of the screen where we're really featuring that 
our work is with and through local partners. And so this notion of culturally appropriate programming is front and center for us. All right, so diving right in on great apes. This is first a map to locate us. I'm gonna to touch on operations in Rwanda where I lived and in DRC where we are also focused now. And just to give you a sense of this remarkable landscape. So this is the Rwanda side of um, a, a view of these volcanoes, a string of volcanoes that runs the border with Democratic Republic of Congo and with Uganda combination of dormant and then on the DRC side still active volcanoes, a stunning landscape. And this is where indeed I focused my efforts. This is a what my daughters would call a vintage photo mom. Um, but this is indeed back in 1995. So just after the Rwandan genocide and civil war, when I was working with park rangers to put back in place the infrastructure for park management, for mountain gorilla conservation, for community engagement, and more following the genocide. Happily, I did this under the wing of the mentor of the man pictured here. This is Eugène Rutigarama, and when we met, he was senior within the parks department. He subsequently took over for me running mountain gorilla operations and was recognized as a CNN hero, a Goldman Environmental Prize winner, and more an extraordinary individual. And he, like so many Rwandans, experienced devastating loss, including many of his family members during the genocide, and yet is a voice to this day for the power of reconciliation and healing. So we feel very fortunate to have him as our conservation advisor. I love this shot because he hasn't aged a bit, has he? But <laughs> I look a little different now. But nonetheless, we are just delighted to have him guiding our operations in this important region. And there's been such good news to celebrate. Um, for those of you that follow great ape trends, you will know that this is the one population whose trends are headed in the right direction. So this is a growing population numbering at a thousand and more and a sign of what we can do with sustained investment and engagement over decades. So none of this happens overnight. But this also suggests our next chapter, and I'm gonna turn back to this at the end of the remarks if we have time, because this reminded me of um, things that I've seen of rotary investment over time. So maybe we can circle back to this, but recognizing that mountain gorilla conservation was really moving along quite well, we thought about what was our next chapter and point of investment for Rwanda, and Eugène introduced me to this woman in the white shirt that her name is Atanezi and she runs a cooperative, a women-led cooperative in Rwanda and they devote themselves to building these rainwater harvest tanks that you see pictured here. So for us this addresses two things, the improved family well-being which is front and center for families living right in the foothills of the mountain gorilla habitat and then also reduces the remaining pressure on the mountain gorillas which is Many of these families still need to walk more than three hours each and every day, oftentimes into the park to gather water. And this introduces a risk for wildlife and also pulls children out of school and just causes loss of time that these women could direct to other um, revenue producing endeavors. So we will circle back to that. All right, I'm going to now shift us across the border into the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is a cousin to the mountain gorilla, looks pretty similar, but with, with some differences. It's another Eastern gorilla, but this one is known as Grower's gorilla. And we have been focused on that since 2017 with this man, primatologist August M. Basabose. We worked together on mountain gorilla conservation for many years. And then August M. formed a Congolese NGO called Primate Expertise devoted to taking the learning from these mountain gorilla years and accelerating it so that we can soon have the same sort of success story for Grower's gorillas that we share for mountain gorillas. So he works with Parks Department staff, which now I'm happy to report also include female rangers as pictured here, and they tackle a range of threats to wildlife across a landscape and a park that's called Kahuzi Biega National Park in the eastern part of the country. 
So pictured here, of course, are snares. These can really cause devastating impact. And pictured here is young juvenile male Mateo, and you'll see he's missing a, a hand, otherwise a very healthy male gorilla. But um, again, these are some of the things that can happen, although gorillas are not the direct target for snares and for, um, for poaching, sometimes they are the casualty. So much of our effort is really targeted to very effective anti-poaching patrols to preclude what happened to young Mateo years ago. That was back in 2010, before we started our work. So now you'll see this map just to give you a sense of the, um, the number of snares and the location and where they are gathering those. And just to give you a sense, just last year alone, this is a large park. We're focused on patrolling an area that's just over 100 square kilometers. And we gathered over 462 snares just last year. So this remains a, a key threat to wildlife in the region. And again, when I say wildlife, of course, it is not just growers, gorillas, or not just great apes. This is an area of extraordinary biodiversity. So I give you a snapshot and why many primatologists so enjoy focusing on this, um, this area of the world. So you've got um, many different species and maybe even some new ones. So we're keeping an eye bottom left on this lovely owl-faced monkey, the one with the white stripe down the nose. And there may be a, a separate subspecies that's unique to this region. So again, doing research and of course also tracking, you know, upper left chimpanzees as another great ape that shares space with growers, gorillas, and more. One of the things I admire deeply about both the success story that characterized our mountain gorilla journey and indeed this continuing journey with Augustan is the focus equally both inside the park and outside. And so here um, you are seeing Augustan with a member of an indigenous Batwa village that is immediately on the periphery of the park with whom we are building community run tree nurseries. These are special trees for us because each and every one of them in his hand has been grown from a seed that Augustan gathered from gorilla dung or chimp dung. So he's recovering these seeds initially through research to try to understand what great apes were eating. And then he had a hunch that these would probably grow really easily in that the seeds had gone through the gut of a great ape. And he was absolutely right. And this special program now is flourishing and is delivering um, tree seedlings, both for community use and for restoring degraded areas of the park. And just to give you a sense for the, for the park, we restored over 50 hectares of degraded forest just last year. And just last year, there were over 15,580, I think the number was, seedlings that came out of these community tree nurseries. So a wonderful scalable initiative that again is this win-win for people and for wildlife. As you can imagine, much, much of this last year, and this is ongoing as it is for all of us, has been focused on the impact of the pandemic. So very soon after the onset of COVID-19, governments in ape range states stopped tourism to them because that was gonna be dangerous and the potential for transmission from humans to great apes is quite high. And that was absolutely the right decision. In a place like Democratic Republic of the Congo, where they rely so heavily on tourism revenue, both inside the park for operations and outside in the communities, this of course was devastating. So we stepped in soon after tourism stopped to help with um, material delivery. So this is emergency food distribution and materials distribution, PPE and other hygienic materials to allow the park um, rangers to effectively and safely do their work. And then outside in the community is the same so that there was food support and also hygienic supplies to keep people safe. 
I'm going to shift gears now. So if there are any burning questions, you can either ask them or, or save them for the end. But I am going to take us to a very different corner of the world where we are active and have been for decades. And that is in Southeast Asia. I love looking at this poster that's up there to the right of the wonderful Asian elephant shot. And that shows the director of our program, and his name is Toy Sarai Vatna. He's known as Vatna, but his nickname for a long time has also been Uncle Elephant. And we had the great pleasure of shooting our first short film. This is a four and a half minute film. And my colleague who's joined me today is going to pop something into the chat function. So if you are interested in seeing this, this is a four minute film and something I think you'll really enjoy. For those that follow the DC Environmental Film Festival that just happened here, you may have noticed that last year we were featured in that film festival for Uncle Elephant. And in fact, Vatana had arrived to the US moments before this pandemic sort of hit everyone's consciousness because he was poised to be celebrated by the festival for his life's work and for this short film. So like a house of cards, all of that tumbled and very quickly we had him on a plane home to, to Cambodia, but it was a great honor for us. And um, we were also invited to the United Nations for World Wildlife Day. And more recently we're in the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. So a great, great honor to see this work hit the big screen um, and to see this team celebrated for work that is across some of the most intact forests remaining in Southeast Asia, where we're working collaboratively. So with community members, like the man in the striped shirt, Ben in the middle and park rangers far right with our team, that's Vatana far left with our lead biologist right next to him. So again, collaborative engagement geared to protecting some of the remarkable wildlife in this forest area called Prelong Forest and using some of the same tools that we just featured in our work in DRC. So this is a field camera, our camera trap as they're, um, as they're called. That was what captured the images of wildlife that you saw in the earlier slides. And here again, remarkable what these field cameras can show us and can help us learn about the best ways to accelerate protection for wildlife. So not only were we totally delighted to see this intact family unit of Asian elephants on your bottom right, including, you know, a young baby. These birth rates are always a good sign, but we're seeing other wildlife that is awfully difficult to track on foot, like the sun bear top right. For those of you that enjoy ungulates, as I certainly do, top left, you'll see a bantang. And then bottom left, you'll see silvered langur, all with feeling private with their back to the camera, but nonetheless, um, a healthy group with that youngster that has not yet changed color. These are wonderful signs for us in terms of a healthy forest and showing us that which lives within. And one of the things we spend a lot of time on, again, focus inside the forest, but focused right out, bringing some of the images off those camera traps, blowing them up for robust environmental education and celebrating and environmental skits and more with communities that live right on the edge of these important forested areas. Shifting now quickly to the coast where we have a program also that is devoted to protection of some of this region's most intact and biodiverse seagrasses. So you'll see right in the water with this shot, you know, this, this healthy seagrass meadow, which is one of the largest in this region. This program is run by the woman on the right for us. Her name is Leng Paula. She is one of few female marine biologists in Cambodia, and we hope she is a trailblazer and, and charting a future course for far more engagement in this sector. Again, this is a really important area, both for mangroves as pictured here. We've got over one third of the coral reef in the region right here in this project area where we work and some extraordinary biodiversity. So you're seeing again, marine turtles. Um, this is a hawksbill critically endangered. There are also endangered green turtles that we're keeping an eye on. Top right, you'll see dugong, also known as manatee near to us. 
bottom right, this is a seahorse. There are more than four different species, all threatened of seahorse that we've found in our surveys of these marine habitats. And then bottom right, that's a tough one to see, but does anyone have an idea of what we might be seeing there? That's a, that's a tough question, <laughs> but we get excited with this one because indeed it is an Irrawaddy dolphin. And so we are catching glimpses of these and this is a freshwater um, that swims down to the, the ocean. So we see some of this brackish engagement and we are keeping a close eye on this. Our team, again, has been delighted recently to be asked by the government of Cambodia to lead on putting in place a new community managed marine protected area. So this will be about 32 square miles where we will protect the, the biodiversity assets that are also so key for the livelihoods of fishing communities that are along this area. So together we are doing surveys. Bottom left, you'll see government colleagues joining with us on mangrove recovery efforts. And then again, bottom right, a lot of community outreach and celebration with these uh, coastal communities. Keeping along a marine theme here, but bringing us a little closer to home now, this is our work in El Salvador. And this is a remarkable story, both this is an absolutely delightful team, as you can see from this photo. This is our partner, it's a Salvadoran NGO called Procusta. And Procusta has been absolutely key for more than a decade now, and for hawksbill turtle recovery. So about a decade ago, hawksbill turtles were considered extinct in the Eastern Pacific. There was no known nesting occurring. And then seemingly overnight, this team joined with us and began to rediscover that indeed hawksbill were nesting in this region, but they were nesting in remote mangrove systems. And so almost overnight, El Salvador kind of rose as globally relevant for hawksbill turtle recovery. This was exceptional news for a critically endangered marine turtle. And so now we work across a local um, conservation network that is comprised largely of former egg poachers and artisanal fishermen, these frontline spotters when these female hawksbill um, turtles come in to nest. So our job becomes ensuring that that is successful nesting and then to ensure that those eggs are able to hatch out in safe conditions. So you see a member of the Procosta team, what she's got in her lap is a newly laid nest of eggs, so she is transporting those with exquisite care to a community-run hatchery. And through this system, just last year, we experienced in one of our beaches a 99.3% protection rate for nests, and we released over 28,000 hatchlings to the sea. So recently we gathered and had our first webinar um, to talk with members of the Procusta team about this success story that they have been building for the past decade. And we were inspired to do more of these. So again, look in your kind of chat um, for details about how you can join one of our next webinars if you're so inclined. This next one, we are gonna feature the work of Augustin Basabose in DRC. So we'd love to have you. All right, finally, we're gonna circle around to our work with threatened trees. And I'll give you a few examples of this. This uh, finds expression across our global portfolio, but we do focus in on specific areas. I find I always love looking at this image and this is a remarkable tree that was new to science just a few years ago. So our botanist, Dr. Stephen Brewer, discovered this one and it inspired him to then gather with colleagues with whom he had been working for, gosh, close to 30 years now in, in Belize, cataloging the remarkable 
species diversity for trees in Belize. And so they've decided to pull that together. And now we have a partnership with the University of Belize and the Environmental Research Institute within that university to really pull together the first ever comprehensive volume documenting the trees of Belize. So it sounds funny to say it because one would imagine that this has already been done, right? How many naturalist guides and tree guides exist in the US? But indeed, this has never been done for, for Belize. And you can imagine then what a roadblock that is for effective management. Again, this, this saying of, you know, to manage well, you've got to know what you're managing. And that is, that is a foundational truth. So we are looking to compile with um, Belizean colleagues all of these records and really get this done. So I'd love to pause and just ask if you have an idea of how many tree species if we're thinking about the entire country, how many tree species do you imagine there are in Belize? Or how thousand. many tree species? Hmm? 2,000. 2,000. That's actually pretty close. Any idea, Barry, how many in the United States? I do not. Excuse me. <clears throat> Perhaps 4,000. Well, it's an interesting bit of trivia because it's kind of, we'll, we'll flip those data points and you'd almost be right. So for Belize, we've got more tree species than in the continental US and Canada combined. We used to say double, but there's some splitting of figures, but it is extraordinary, right? The, the um, species diversity that exists in, in Belize. And we've got a country that's as big as the state of New Jersey, or if you're a New Englander like I am, we use New Hampshire. So pretty extraordinary. And this is why we are focusing there strategically. Again, getting this done, and we're hopefully going to have a digital app soon that we can then trial and just sort of build out this knowledge and data set and drive improved conservation um, along the way. So we are really excited about this this work and the collaborative nature of it. There is so much still to protect in Belize. So any idea what tree this is? Yeah. I heard one. So this is an enormous mahogany, right? Oh, nice. and, you know, just remarkable. And so in Belize, again, we've got under 500,000 people living in the country. So we've got, you know, low population density. We've got high species diversity for trees. And we've got some of the most intact forests in all of Mesoamerica. So we love this recipe for success. And we are, we are running hard at this Trees of Billy's catalog and improved collaborative management of its forests. And I'm going to land here on this final slide. Again, any, any, um, anyone know what trees we're looking at here? Cypress. Yeah. So, you know, this was just a wonderful realization for me that this particular stand of bald cypress exists a stone's throw from where we all are. And this is in the Great Cypress Swamp in Delaware. So we have launched this year a new collaboration. This will be our first US collaboration with a statewide land trust called Delaware Wildlands, an extraordinarily talented team. And they own fee title to this 10,600 acre parcel. And they are engaging and with our help, we're gonna accelerate restoration of this forested wetland. Um, and we're gonna focus in on restoration of two native tree species, bald cypress and also Atlantic white cedar, both of which are at the northernmost expression of their range right now in the, the swamp. And this is really important as we think about our changing climate and climate mitigation strategies. This is a really important piece of the Chesapeake Bay and a rapidly changing part of the Delmarva Peninsula. It's also really important for neotropical migratory birds and other species. So much like um, the rotary structure, we were talking about focusing locally and then thinking globally. And this is a great example of that. We've got every reason to protect it for Delawareans and for people in the region, 
but also linkages that extend through the Atlantic Flyway, so an international relevance of this particular parcel. So more on this in the months and ahead, but our botanist Stephen Brewer is in the swamp right now. I think he's a little chilly this morning, truth <laughs> be told, but he is engaging in a um, botanic survey early springtime to help build out um, the knowledge base so that we can drive more effective management. And we're going to plant a bunch of seedlings come fall. So we're really looking forward to seeing this new collaboration take full shape. Um, and I think I'm gonna pause, pause there. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, if there's quite, we'll entertain some questions. I'll start off with a question. You seem to be doing so many things with animals, with the oceans, with the trees. Do you, how do you, I guess I'm interested a little bit in the mechanics. People come to you for expertise to partner. Do they come primarily for funds, for um, what is your global, how do you see the criteria that you pick your partners with? Right, that's a great question, Linda. And particularly here where we've got um, a number of large international biodiversity groups that people are familiar with, right? So from the Nature Conservancy to World Wildlife Fund, you know, on down the road. So really our, um, our differentiator is this way of working that you just framed, Linda. It is the collaboration with very talented in-country practitioners, many of whom we've known for decades and decades, and with whom we can now drive their work forward. Um, it's a combination of technical engagement, financial support, um, and it's different in each of the places we work. So in Cambodia, we are registered as an international NGO, and that is, that is our team implementing there. That was the best format for Cambodia. In a place like DRC, where we've got talent like August Ambasabose and a Congolese NGO that I am inspired to stand behind, that becomes our job is doing some planning work with, with Augustin to increase the effectiveness of his interventions and then opening up channels, particularly US philanthropic channels that can reach him that otherwise he would not have access to. Mm. We've Thank got you. a very detailed program selection partnership selection criteria. You touched on that. Um, I won't go into full detail on that, but I can certainly share that with those that are interested. And I will say we run lean. So I am a former field director. This is what I believe deeply in. So we've got a small US team. We're consistently a four-star charity navigator um, charity and top ranking on GuideStar and other platforms. This is very deliberate. We've got a lean structure that allows us to be very responsive to field realities, move quickly and move the majority of contributed dollars right out to the field. So I, have, Katie, I, have, I don't know if you're aware or not, but um, Rotary has um, added the environment as one of our areas, one of the areas of focus now. Um, one of our, if you want to call it our service lane. So now um, it has, I think it just started this year, if I'm remembering correctly. Correct. Um, yes. And so it is a big, um, a, a, I wouldn't say a brand new push, but it's a, now an area of focus for Rotary. And so clubs and and uh, our foundation um, are going to be focused on environmental issues. So, so Katie, Katie music's my ears, Victoria. Mm -hmm. Oh, Katie, I had two questions. One, the mahogany that you mentioned, the trees, which is pretty much prevalent in Southeast Asia, and it's also the most expensive wood uh, used in furniture and buildings and so on. So is it being threatened, the whole mahogany? It's Indonesia, it's India, Ceylon, in that part of the world. The mahogany is, a, is the, uh, traditionally is the most expensive and used in a lot of, you know, uh, buildings. The second question related to where do you get the funding for your efforts, the nonprofit organization? Two very good questions. So mahogany, um, 
indeed is one of the most trafficked hardwoods. So that yeah. is caught up in a lot of illegal wildlife trade. Yeah. And, um, and so too other species that we are tracking in Belize, but also in Cambodia, like rosewood. So um, a lot of these, again, you know, they are, you know, it is cause for concern, it's cause for targeted action. Um, and it's all about, you know, sustainable perspectives. So they are very beautiful hardwoods. So one can understand why there's been so much pressure, but they now require targeted action. And we're working to increase the red listing of those species under the IUCN, you know, protection categories. And again, just making sure, for example, in Belize, one of the things that we realized was that many of the members within the forest department, for example, they were really good at identifying and taking action where there was illegal harvest of things like mahogany once it was on the back of a truck, right? Identifying those cut down trees and those logs, that was, that was core expertise they were less skilled at identifying those in the forest, interestingly. And so this has been some of the focus of our efforts. You know, let's increase the skills so that we can actually understand where these threatened hardwoods are and understand the best ways to drive increased protection. Your second question around where does our funding come from? Another good one. So historically it's been a hybrid portfolio of um, a small bit of US government funding, principally through the US Fish and Wildlife Service. We're hoping that reappears under this administration for the past four years that that was, that was stalled. US Fish and Wildlife Service funding did not reach us. So we have been for the past four years, 100% privately financed, both individual philanthropy and foundations that run the gamut from small family foundations through to larger um, foundations like a yeah, like a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation is an example. Um, okay, thank you. I had a question. I don't know if you covered it earlier, but how did you get started, and what was the when? When was that, and what was the inspiration? Oh, Kevin, probably in the womb is the most <laughs> accurate <laughs> response to that. I think it's just always been my passion, you know. So I, I grew up in Southern Connecticut, so not the wildest corner of the United States by any means, but um, where I grew up was a former onion farm, which I loved learning that. And the forest behind our property, at that point it was kind of a suburban neighborhood, but it was a recovering forest. It was not a primary forest, but boy, I spent much of my childhood just sort of rummaging around in that, that New England landscape. And I think that's always been what I wanted to do. Okay. Katie, Katie uh, in your very last picture, you uh, had the cypress in the uh, Great Cypress area in Delaware. Uh, it seems that uh, cypress are disappearing in the United States because so many of them are being harvested early from mulch. Is that a continuing problem or is that something that's being addressed in some rational fashion? All right. It has been a problem. It is, and certainly far more um, landscaping outfits are talking about that and consumers are aware of where that mulch comes from. But it is, it is a driver, certainly, for loss. I think uh, the biggest driver, certainly, though, is habitat conversion. So this property, we're so kind of inspired by the potential of the Great Cypress Swamp because it was radically altered years and years ago. This was kind of crisscrossed with roads and had been cut up for agricultural production. So this is a recovering landscape. And um, so that is the other thing driving loss is just rapid conversion to, um, to residential development and to agricultural development. So yeah. figuring out again, that balance of land uses, I think is, is a challenge. Thank you. Uh, uh, Katie, I have one quick question. Mm -hmm. If you were going to protect um, any area of the US, or even every any area of Maryland. Is there some place in particular 
that you think we need help here in the state? Ooh, that is, I should have prepared for that one, Linda. That is a, that is a great one. You know, we live in an extraordinary watershed and, and, you know, we have so many opportunities. I, I'm sure I'm not alone in having part of my sanity during this pandemic was being able to get out into these extraordinary natural areas we do have that are part of Rock Creek watershed and that broader Chesapeake Bay. So I would, you know, for us, I think it's take your pick. There are so many important parts of that watershed. And I think, um, you know, place by place for there to be some increased local action um, and to reduce the, the runoff into that watershed, I think would be a, a real point of focus for me. Mm. I also would love to see people just not freak out quite so much when they hear a coyote these days. So how oh. wonderful is it that we have, you know, some of these canids, you know, back in our landscape or as a naturalist said you know he said it's not like they're back here they actually weren't here historically it's just they're here now um, but I think again this assemblage of species that is changing as our natural landscape changes I'd love to see us celebrate that and have an have an easier kind of human wildlife relationship with some of these mm. species so but well, we are at the um, bottom of our hour um, so thank you so much. This was wonderful. 